Can't you just put a picture of George Clooney up here and then I'll talk? <laughs> no? That, that, there's a reason we're not on camera. I'll just leave it at that. Just thinking about it. Kevin, you can say when I'm ready. All right. All right. Ready. Start. Well, Steve, uh, again, my name is John Paris. We introduced ourselves off camera, but we'll do so on camera. I'm the chair of the Asian American group. Excuse me. I'm the chair of the uh, endorsement committee for the Asian American group. Uh, on behalf of uh, our president, Mike Viswani, and our vice president, uh, Kevin Funk, we'd like to uh, welcome you to, uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our general election endorsement. For the individuals who are watching this at, at home or at a later date, this is Steve Brown. He is the Libertarian candidate for con Congressional District 4. Currently, the incumbent in that district is Crescent Heart. Um, I realize uh, you've been sitting, uh, waiting patiently for your, your time before the uh, uh, time in the spotlight, so to speak. But just to uh, refresh your memory, uh, the Asian American group's been in existence for about 20 years now. For the last eight years, we've been doing panel-style interviews like this, uh, just to give uh, individuals an opportunity to have a, a better chance to get to know their various candidates for the various races. Uh, and again, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join us. First question that we're asking of all the candidates is the same, and that is this. Why have you decided to run for this particular race at this particular time? Very simple, because there's so many issues that are never talked about. It's like they're off limits for both parties. They just like they kind of narrow. We're going to talk about guns, just like we always do. And we're going to talk about a few other issues, but we're never going to talk about, hey, America really is going bankrupt. That, that's for real. That, that's off the table. We've been at war for 15 years now. We're no closer to victory than we were when we started. We need to have a serious discussion about that. We have mass incarceration. In CD4, mass incarceration is a serious issue. So is police brutality. They're not going to talk about that at all. We can just go right down that list. So that's what I could complain about it the rest of my life, or I could get involved with it. And that's what I'm trying to do. I want to, I want to at least talk, get the candidates to talk about these issues, which, quite frankly, you look at it, they're not talking about any of these seriously what I'm talking about. Well, uh, one could argue that both uh, Donald Trump and uh, Bernie Sanders kind of rode this wave of momentum for, for many voters who felt they were unrepresented or underrepresented. Um, and you had touched on some of the issues which were very important to many of those people um, who joined the political process uh, and, and because they finally found someone who made them, who ended their feelings of, of disenfranchisement. What ideas do you have? Obviously, you're not from a major political party, um, or one of the I'm a two Italian. major political parties. Uh, I apologize. It's, it's, it's um, no offense taken. What ideas do you have to try and harness that momentum and, and, and continue uh, to cultivate those individuals who, you know, before the most recent primaries, really weren't participating in the political process? Well, let's start off with like uh, the issues affecting CD4 which is basically north of Lake Mead, except it dips down in between Rancho and I-15 down to the 95, the old west side of town. Uh, police brutality is a big issue in those places. The mass incarceration, uh, the war on drugs, we gotta stop this war on drugs, which is just nothing but a very corrupt money-making scam is all it is. Uh, it's got nothing to do with, uh, with making the public safe. It makes the public more unsafe than safe. Uh, we have a school-to-prison pipeline Nobody even talks about that. I got some ideas on how to correct that. I mean, we, how come they don't have an urban jobs program for all these? See, Donald Trump made a pretty good point the other day, but he, he's got, he talked about going through this neighborhood. He was in Philadelphia, and he talked about the black men out of work. Well, I went through a, a housing project the other day of the black teenagers who don't have a job. It starts, the teenagers just don't have any work. When I was young, my dad had me working on a sawmill when I was 11. Now, we were not poor. That's just the culture I grew up in. But we always had work. These teenagers do not have work. So they're hanging out in the streets. They've got no opportunity. They get arrested. Once they get into that system, you could be in that system for life. If you, you, all you got to do is just get arrested. And if the cop follows you around, you go apply for a job, you've never been arrested, you don't have to be convicted of anything. It's kind of like they get caught up in the system. And then what Donald Trump talked about, yeah, those men who are unemployed, yeah, they may have got caught up in the system when they were younger. 
why can somebody tell me why our government doesn't provide a year-round job program for urban youth to do work that actually needs to be done? And when we give away $35 million a year in foreign aid, we got corporate welfare, we got all this other money, how come we don't have money for something as basic as a jobs program for urban youth? And then, of course, the schools, we got plenty of money for our schools. If anybody doubts that, go to transparentnevada.com. Transparentnevada.com. And you're going to be, you'll be astounded by the amount of money people are making in this town. Just the school district alone, I counted over 3,000 non-teaching administrators and school police who make over 100 grand a year. Let's do some quick math on that one. Let's say they make 134,000 a year. You know how much 134,000 times 3,000 is? That's over 400 million. Not one dollar of that went to a teacher. So in other words, for every dollar we're spending on teachers, how many dollars are we spending on administrators? The point I'm trying to make, we got plenty of money to pay our teachers more money. We're just not, we're just not paying them. So folks are living in the urban areas, their kids are going to bad schools, overcrowded classrooms, okay? <laughs> then they go out, there's no work for them. That, that is a prescription for a disaster right there. No bad schools, no work, and then we keep going on from there. Okay, so the bad issues never get talked about. And that's one of the reasons why I'm running. You want more? Well, from a federal perspective, I mean, we realize there's only so much D.C. Uh, can do to affect uh, inner city schools or, or to affect school district policy on a more local level. But from a more federal level, what ideas do you have, assuming you're elected, to try and enact some of these proposals like uh, the jobs program and things of that nature? Well, that's number one, the job program. Number two, as far as, you see, a congressman, we don't have a vote in our local schools, right? But Martin Luther King said, silence is betrayal. We, the Congress, people in Congress don't have a vote, but they have a voice. They could say something. Uh, Republican legislature passed the largest tax increase in Nevada history. There's four Republicans in Congress. We have Crescent Hardy, Joe Heck, Mark Amati and Dean Heller. How come they didn't say anything? Where were they when this discussion was going on? They, they had a voice. They couldn't affect the policy. They couldn't vote on it, but they could sure lobby for it. How come they don't say anything? I mean, Joel Heck is going around. He was, oh, I would love to ask him this question. That tax increase that they passed, was he for it and didn't say anything, or is he against it and just party loyalty? But get back to the, okay, let's get back to the federal level. So number one, a congressman can actually affect local policies by speaking out. Then you could affect a jobs program for inner city youth. Then we got a Department of Education that meddles, right? They've been in business for 36 years. They, they became a cabinet level position in an administration of Jimmy Carter. Go to their website, you can't find one accomplishment they've got in 36 years. Not one. That could have easily been done at the local level. If your favorite football team ran 36 running plays in a row and didn't pick up one first down, whoever called those plays would be fired as soon as the game is over. So why do we have this Federal Department of Education, they've proven beyond any reasonable doubt they can't do the job right. Why do we want to keep giving them more money? They, they need to pull the plug on that thing and let the local school districts more control, the, the, the principals and the teachers, give them more control in the classrooms. And those 3,000 bureaucrats working for the school district knocking down six figures a year, we just exactly, well, why would you want to pay these people all this money and then give a teacher 40000 a year? Do you have to realize how hard time they have recruiting teachers? We're short on teachers again. Now, you know, it would be even worse that they increased class size. Kind of slipped that one in there by one. They eliminated 3,000 or 300 teachers. Check it. It was on the, in the paper the other day. They eliminated 300 teaching positions because they increased class size. See, that's one way to reduce a teacher shortage. All right. We've got the money for teachers, we've always had the money, but, but why do we have to have so many administrators and why do they have to be paid so much money? Somebody needs to say something. So yeah, that's a local issue, but where's our members of Congress? How come they never, how come nobody ever says anything about it? You can affect policy simply by speaking out, right? I don't have the microphone now. The people of Congress do, they could say something. Earlier I had, um Accidentally ref made a reference that uh, you are not a member of a, a major political party. We're, we aren't. 
or yeah. small. I'm not saying that was incorrect, but um, well, we're working on it though. Certainly, and progress is being made. Uh, we had asked the question of a previous some previous individuals about Citizens United, which really does tend to give the two major, the Republican and Democratic parties, uh, an insurmountable leg up in comparison to many smaller parties because we don't have that same uh, financial base from which to draw. Uh, assuming you're elected, what, if anything, do you feel needs to be done uh, about Citizens United? You see, that was just a horrible piece of legislation. It was basically, it was legislation. See, Citizens United started off, this group called Citizens United wanted to run a documentary about Hillary Clinton within a month of an election. That's all it was, that's all the argument was over. And then they sued and it worked its way up to the Supreme Court, right? Those lawyers never asked, they, they never suggested that corporations were people. And they weren't asking for unlimited campaign contributions for big corporations. John Roberts is the one who wanted that. He used that as an excuse to pass his own, he had his own agenda. If you look it up, that, that's actually what happened. So that's basically the legislation is what it was. They, you gotta find some way to strike that thing down. Now, I'm not, I'm not supporting Hillary Clinton, okay? But having said that, she gets on the president, she'll appoint some of the, basically it's a, it's a political Supreme Court is what you have. You got four Republicans, four Democrats. She's gonna appoint a Democrat. Hopefully somebody will challenge that law and will get struck down, or Congress can do something about it. You gotta do something to get rid of that law because it's an absolutely horrible law. Whether you're a libertarian or, or who you support, it's just, it was legislation, it guised it in the form of a law, is what it was. So, do, do you feel that uh, legislatively you could uh, mitigate the effects of this, uh, of the Supreme Court's decision? It has to be struck down in its entirety, that thing there. Corporations are not people. They said that just so their friends could donate as much money unlimited to, to politicians. The, the situation was bad before, but that made it even much worse. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about the Supreme Court. Uh, obviously, Merrick Garland has been waiting quite patiently to be vetted or not, right. and voted on or not. Um, assuming you, well, what is your position on how the, uh, the parties have kind of dug their heels in and have said, are for or against it, and then we're not going to move forward on this issue. Well, in that particular case, that see, I'm, I'm independent, I'm libertarian. That's the Republicans' fault. They should have voted on it. They obviously did that, hoping that now Donald Trump gets elected and they can keep their five-four majority on the Supreme Court. But they did it for obviously political purposes, plain and simple. Yeah, and they and it worked, at least for now, anyway. Uh, are you? Favor of that, or you? No, okay? they should have. They should have let him vote on. They should have had. He should have. He probably should be sitting on the Supreme Court now. I mean, as long as he's qualified. I mean, I'm, I don't really know much about the man, but if he's qualified, that's the basis by which you should be, yay or nay, on the Supreme Court. Just not not politics, whether you're for or against abortion or something like that. Do, do you feel that the Supreme Court should m maintain a? Quasi-nonpartisan stance. Well, that, that will all argue with you. They are not. To me, they are very partisan. They are a political Supreme Court. And you look at some of those. It's like Citizens United was just an awful ruling. But there's some terrible ruling. Kentucky versus King. Well, you read about that's a just a terrible ruling. And some of the other ones that they've had. Kentucky versus King basically gave the police the right to break into your house without a warrant. Is what it was. Just a terrible ruling. 2011. And that's an awful one. And then last summer there's this. Case. I think it's Strife versus Utah. Uh, that's another terrible ruling. Now they can just stop you on the street for anything and frisk you, and they have the right to do it. They keep chipping away at our constitutional rights steadily. But if you look where we've gone in the past 10 years, somebody's got to stop it. Mike, I know you sometimes have some questions. I don't know if you want to jump in. I know I already asked. Uh, oh, I was questions you talked about. You, you gave the answers already. Yeah. I, I agree with you on the last few ones. That's a few of the statements you make, I agree with you 100% here. Thank you. Um, before we let you go, we, we, obviously national security is, is a, a fundamental importance to all of us, um, not only within our country, but also from an international standpoint, minimizing the impact of terrorism. Um, 
assuming you are elected from a congressional standpoint, what ideas do you have to try and promote, well, to try and, for lack of a better term, just attack ISIS and, and minimize its impact on a global scene? Well, why is it that we have to do everything? In 1968, at the Republican National Convention, candidate Richard Nixon said, this was during the height of the Cold War, he said, our allies need to do more where their interests are as great as ours. He said that we're a rich country, we're prosperous, but he went on to talk about we paid for everything, for Korea and Vietnam. Now, our country was much stronger back then economically than we are today. We were carried in debt. Back in 68, uh, products were manufactured in America, uh, taxes are lower, job, jobs paid more, cost of college education was cheaper, baby boomers were aged in age from three to 22, while now we're retiring in massive numbers, there's no money in that social security trust fund, we're buried in debt, we're going, we are going bankrupt, and yet for some reason, we're the ones who gotta pay for everything. How come we don't have a president, like wherever else you say about Richard Nixon, he had this part right. How come our president doesn't ask some of our so-called allies to do more? Are you honestly telling us Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, they're right there. They can't put together a force of 15,000 men to go in there and do what we're doing. You, they can't do it, how about France? What are the issues they have? Can't they do more? How about all these other countries? Why do we, we're the ones who are broke. How come we gotta do everything? And as far as being broke, well, does this affect Japan and these countries in the Far East? Is, don't they have an interest in this? It's not just China we owe money to. We owe Japan over a trillion. We owe Taiwan 188 million. Hong Kong 184. Singapore 107. Uh, Thailand, 48 billion. We owe Philippines, 42 billion. We owe countries all over the world money. I'm just talking about the Asian ones. We haven't even got into Europe or Africa, or we owe Mexico over 50 billion. I'd like to ask someone from the Trump campaign, you know when Donald Trump's talking about main, making Mexico pay for that wall they don't want? That pretty, it takes a lot of gall considering how much money we owe them. You know, you build something you don't want, you pay for it, and we owe you all. Anyway, I'm getting off track here. But you see, and so we owe money all over the world. We owe Canada money. Why? I mean, that should be the biggest issue. You're talking about ISIS. How about the fact the country's going bankrupt? And how come we don't have someone like Richard Nixon ask our allies to do more? We have more allies. Hey, we were fighting the Soviet Union, and it was still Red China back then when he said that. It was two and a half years before he would go there. So we need to tell our allies they got to do plain and simple, and they can. It's not whether they can or they can't, it's whether they will or they won't. And as long as we keep putting the bill for everything, they won't do it. So we need to stop that. Well, Keith, uh, it's always difficult, you know, many of our questions are set up such that we have more, more than one person on the dais at any given point in time, uh, but as you've noticed, you're the only person up there. So we go through this a little more quickly. Do me a favor, give me 30 seconds. Why are you the best candidate in this race? We'll finish with that. I've been in business for almost 30 years. I'm a contractor, I have six people working for me. So I understand small business has absolutely no voice, no input. I was away, I was a dealer for six years. I was away from the business for 25. And it took so long to recover from the Great Recession that I, so I'm actually a part-time dealer downtown. So I'm, I'm working for the minimum wage plus chips at night and then I'm the employer in the daytime. So I got experience both, plus I'm a veteran. And I know all about VA because that president I'm getting jerked around by them. I have basal cell carcinoma, mild form of skin cancer. And this has been going on for three months. I can tell you all about that, what veterans have to go through and some of the ideas they have for fixing that. And so I know all about business. I know about working for the minimum wage. And I understand the VA healthcare system. And I've taken the time to research a lot of other issues that never get talked about. Thank you. We appreciate your time today. Thank you for your